Greetings and welcome to the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast series. Podcast episodes are available on VHHA.com and on popular podcast hosting apps, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, and many others. Episodes of the podcast also air each Saturday at noon and Sunday at 10 a.m. on 100.5 FM, 92.7 FM, and 820 a.m. across Central Virginia. Please send any questions, comments, or feedback to PCF Podcast at VHHA.com. Again, that is PCF Podcast at VHHA.com. And since 2021 is an election year in Virginia, we're doing a special podcast spinoff series. We've invited every declared statewide candidate for the office offices of governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general to participate and speak with healthcare voters about their campaign and ideas. Today, we're pleased to be joined by Winston Sears, a Republican candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. Winston Sears previously served in the Virginia General Assembly as a member of the House of Delegates and has the distinction as the first black female Republican to hold that elected position. She's run for the U.S. Congress and as a 2018 write-in candidate for U.S. Senate. She is a native of Jamaica and grew up in the Bronx, New York, and a United States Marine Corps veteran. With that introduction, let's welcome the Honorable Winston Sears to the program. Thank you so very much for having me. It's great to be here and to get to put forward my views and hopefully to get feedback from your audience. So absolutely thank you for giving me this opportunity. Well, we're very appreciative of you making the time to be with us. So I just gave that brief bio sketch of your life, but I'm sure that there are things I left out. So I want you to have the opportunity to add anything else you'd like listeners to know about your qualifications and to share your elevator pitch for why you believe you're the best candidate among the contenders for the Republican nomination for lieutenant governor. Sure. You know, my father came to America. He was allowed entry, I should say, as a legal immigrant, August 11th of 1963. Now, that date is significant because just 17 days later, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech. And so I said to my dad, why did you come then? It was a bad time for us. It was the height of the civil rights movement. And he said, because this is where the jobs were. This is where the opportunities were. And so he arrived with only $1.75 in his pocket in a suitcase, and he made the best of it. In fact, he took any job he could find and then put himself through school and began his career and consequently is successfully retired in a house, I tell him, that is too big for himself. (laughs) And he says, yes, he says, leave me alone, it's my money. (laughs) So I say all that to say I am not a victim. I don't need a political party to tell me that they're going to fight for me, etc. I just need them to get out of my way. I believe that we can light a candle as that pastor once said, instead of cursing the darkness. You curse the darkness, you're a victim. And this is America, and she may not be what she's supposed to be, but as we say in the black church, she ain't what she used to be. And we've come a long way, and we've got still a ways to go, but we can certainly find ways to communicate with each other that's not full of hate and dread and all that other stuff that's just not good for the health of a commonwealth, much less a country. Well, that's a a great positive outlook. Hi, I'm Julie Dime, VHHA Vice President of Government Advocacy. They say there's an election every year in Virginia, and 2021 is no exception. In November, voters will choose Virginia's next governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, as well as district representatives for all 100 seats in the House of Delegates. Before that, though, there are party nominating contests this spring. On May 8th, Republicans will hold an unassembled convention with voting locations across the state to elect nominees for three statewide offices. Participating in the process requires people to apply to be a convention delegate with their local GOP unit. Delegates will cast ranked choice ballots to determine the nominees. One month later, on June 8th, voters will select Democratic nominees for statewide offices in a primary election open to all registered voters. That same day, voters from both parties will determine nominees in the House of Delegates district races with intra-party contests. Visit the Virginia Department of Elections website to learn more about upcoming elections. And with those important elections on the calendar, your contribution to HOSPAC, VHHA's Political Action Committee, is more important than ever to support candidates who will work to improve health care in Virginia and support the critical work of hospitals and health systems. Any contribution, small or large, helps. Please visit VAHOSPAC.com to contribute. That's V-A-H-O-S-P-A-C dot com to contribute. Thanks so much. Uh, I want to 
transition out of healthcare. As you know, the Commonwealth has made great strides on improving healthcare access and affordability in recent years through healthcare coverage expansion, through a recent law ending surprise medical bills, through the recent approval of a reinsurance program to help reduce rising health insurance premiums on Virginia's, through policies and actions to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and more. Looking ahead, if elected lieutenant governor, how would you leverage the authority of that office to further advance health care in Virginia? So as some may know, the lieutenant governorship is the only statewide office that has a foot in the executive branch as well as the legislative branch. And having been a delegate previously, uh, this is not my first rodeo, so I know how to get things done. And not, I'm not afraid to take on the big possibilities and legislation that will help all of us. And so while I'm going to keep drinking my green juice and eat my Wheaties, you know, because they say just in case, nevertheless, Mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we do get legislation that helps everyone. And one of the things that I would like to see, you know, I'm a small business owner and healthcare has become very expensive for me to provide for my employees. And, you know, I call myself the Department of Health Transportation human health and resources, all of that good stuff, because that's what you do as a small business owner. And I've been scrambling, trying to find, as I said, affordable health care. One of the times that I paid for my employees to go onto the exchange, and another time I found a better product elsewhere, but it's getting harder and harder. And so what we need to do is to increase competition across state lines so that we can have access to the more affordable policies that come when there is competition. We have, for goodness sake, car insurance that is sold across state lines. Why should health be any different? And then furthermore, one of the things we want to continue to really improve is the teledoc system, which has been helpful through the covid crisis because, you know, folks have possibly been seen in their homes and not in the doctor's offices. But I've seen that there's something afoot to reduce the, the, the payment, the compensation to doctors when the teledoc resource is used. And I'm not sure that that's the right way to go about having uh, health insurance more affordable. If anything, it seems to me to be a disincentive so we, we've got to make sure we're not reducing compensation to the healthcare professionals as we try to bring down costs because it might have a whammo effect where it just backfires spectacularly. And we've seen this backfire because when Obamacare was first proposed to us, we were told that our deductibles would greatly, greatly be reduced. And our premiums would also commensurately be greatly reduced, and they were not. In fact, they went up. And we could not keep our doctor, as was promised, and we could not keep our health plan, as was promised. And it's just a shame that we have now a travesty of a medical system, I would think, or health care plans, that they really don't provide what they used to. And so the costs keep going up. But the benefits keep going down, and it was not what we were promised. And so hopefully we can all get together, figure out a better way to do this. But another solution, in addition to the others I've proposed, would be to have small businesses be able to pool resources so we can get maximum benefits in health care for our our employees. That You know, uh, we don't have the great numbers that would be able to dictate the decrease in premiums, et cetera, that we would like. But maybe if we can pool our resources, then we can do that. And certainly another thing we could do would be to pass on the prescription costs that we incur, uh, you, you know, the middleman, there's that middleman concept. And if we can get rid of him and provide the savings to the patient, then that would certainly be helpful. And then, of course, if we can figure out ways to give more incentives to those of us who want to take better care of ourselves and to help others to go that route, then certainly that would help. But what I'm saying all this to say, I'm not the expert. I would definitely defer to the experts as we consider proposing legislation that would be helpful to all of us. And I've done that before, and I hope to do that again so we can pick the brains of those who know better than I am who are experiencing healthcare issues and and their attendant problems and 
successes on a daily basis so we can get to work and, and get us all the best health care possible. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your, your thoughts and, and ideas there. And certainly, we've all observed the fact that health insurance premiums have been on a steady upward trajectory uh, for many, many years now. And the point you raise about reimbursements for virtual visits or telehealth visits is something uh, that a lot of people are focused on. So appreciate you sharing those thoughts. If people want to learn more about you and your candidacy, is there a website or social media accounts where you'd like to direct them? Yeah, go to my website, winsomesears.com, winsomesears.com, and you can see my issues and what I want to be about and how I want to help. And sign up if you haven't already uh, to be a delegate for me because, you know, we all have wonderful ideas. But the fact of the matter is, if we're not elected, then those ideas mean nothing. And as you all probably know, I'm running as a Republican for the lieutenant governorship. And it's all smoke and mirrors if we don't get in. And I do believe this was one of the questions you asked before about why me and not maybe my opponents and not necessarily not my opponents. But we've got some work to do. And the work that we're proposing to do, you've got to get in again to make it happen. And so it's all fairy dust if you don't get in. And I say me because I've been there. I've done it. I've taken on the hard cases. For example, your listeners may remember that I was the one who brought the bill, HB 1100, which uh, reformed 13 different boards, including the medical board. And I did that over the summer. As a result of a JLARC study I read where, unfortunately, some doctors were killing patients and it wasn't getting to the medical board in time until maybe the third hospital where folks were dying. And I thought to myself, well, somebody ought to do something about this. And I was such a rookie. It occurred to me, wait a minute, I am that somebody. And so I took it on. And that study had been there for three years, just waiting, waiting for someone to take it up. And when I took it up, I was told I was committing political suicide, that no one wanted to touch it. But indeed, during the summer, working with a lot of health professionals, including the VHHA and other medical association lobbyists, we got a bill that was agreeable to everyone, which kept the public safe. And it was so good that it was stolen by the then governor. I had to steal it back. But, you know, this is what happens when you have people who I wouldn't say don't have the courage, but are just looking to be elected, not willing to be serving the people, being transparent. And so folks should know that they can count on me. I intend to be a servant leader. I intend to ask the questions I've always asked in all of my positions. For example, I was elected vice president of the State Board of Education. And one of the things I always ask, well, who is not at this table that should be? Who would be uh, getting the kind of service from this person that what would the question be that they would want to ask this person standing in front of me? So I wanted to be in the shoes of the regular folks, of my constituents. So I was never there for me. I was there for whoever I thought didn't have a voice. And so that's what I hope to be, a voice for the people. I uh, just want to clarify a couple of things. Uh, Winsome Sears, the spelling on that, so people know where to look. It's W I N S O M E and then S E A R S. So winsomesears.com. Want to clarify the spelling on that. And then finally, um, you also mentioned uh, the delegate process. So we should point out that. Uh, the Republican unassembled nominating convention is scheduled for May 8, 2021, and individuals who are interested in participating in that process can contact their local Republican city or county unit to register to be a delegate. So uh, good information there that you shared. And then the final question to close out the podcast is a fun personal one that we ask all of our guests, and that is this. If you were stranded on a deserted island, what one book... <laughs> One album and one movie would you take with you to keep yourself company? We will spot you a copy of the religious text of your choice. So other than that, what are your, <laughs> what are your three entertainment survival kit picks? Okay, the movie that I would want would be Terms of Endearment. Okay. Love that movie. You know, the, just the heart, pulling at the heart rings. It's a tearjerker, but love it anyway. Oh, so stupid. So stupid. Somehow I thought, somehow I thought when she finally went... Then it would be a relief. Oh, my sweet darling. 
<laughs> the book that I would want, I have a book. It's a joke book. And I'm going to need to keep my sanity on a deserted island. So if I can get a joke a book, a book of jokes, then that would be awesome. I have one. Um, what is his name? Long time ago, movie star. Gosh, I see. He used to do the USO shows. Bob Hope? Bob Hope. I was never going to get that today, I swear. <laughs> but, yeah, him. Clean, good jokes with stories behind them. And then, uh, what was the other one you wanted? Album is the third one. Album. Yeah, I love something from the sick. I just love all kinds of music. I was playing some Beatles, um, War of 1812 the other day. And, uh, you know, cranked it up, almost blew the speakers out. I love classical music that's loud like that, and I do love reggae. So, I don't know. I'm going to have to get some kind of a podcast or something with all of those <laughs> compilations in there. Okay. Plus, music from the 60s. Okay. <laughs> Well, that sounds good. And with that, that is going to bring us to the close of another episode of the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast. If you like what you heard, please make sure to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe so that you know when new episodes are available. And we want to once again thank our guest, Winston Sears, a Republican candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, for joining us today. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>